Good morning, everyone. And for those of you who are joining us from another time zone, good afternoon. I am truly delighted to welcome you all to Mona Law's sixth annual symposium on law, governance, and society. This year, the theme for the symposium is law and justice in a novel era. And indeed, what novel times we live in. 2020 has been quite a year. And even though in many ways, it's a year we'd like to forget, I'm sure it's one we'll always remember. Yet, it has provided us with an opportunity to continue evolving as we adapt to doing things in new and innovative ways. Take this event, for example. For most of the previous symposium, we have hosted it at a North Coast resort where the backdrop is a picturesque beach with the calming sound of the lapping waves. Today, here we are, each in our own home or office, where the computer monitor provides the setting and its home, the soundtrack for this production. Usually the symposium provides the chance for delegates and presenters to interact over meals, exchange ideas, and generally network in an informal and relaxed environment. Today, whilst we miss that opportunity, one advantage of hosting it on a virtual platform is that we have managed to engage so many participants from all across the world, many of whom would not have otherwise been able to attend in person. So in a way, we are able to expand our horizons even as we seek to broaden the frontiers of our knowledge. For a few months, we grappled with the dilemma of whether to cancel the 2020 symposium. In the end, we decided that the show must go on. And so, although many months delayed, here we are in an online forum. I am especially grateful to the Mona Law team as this weekend's proceedings would not have been possible without their hard work and tireless efforts as they found new and exciting ways to promote and deliver this event. The COVID pandemic has affected every facet of our lives and this will be reflected in the broad range of presentations. I'm sure you'll all agree that the program is truly scintillating with a lineup of expert speakers and chairs who are joining us from Trinidad, Ireland, Canada, Jamaica, the Netherlands, and the USA. Our distinguished keynote speaker is the president of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and he will highlight some of the challenges facing the judiciary in this novel era. After that, the first session will explore the dynamic area of financial regulation, which aims to provide effective measures to protect other people's money. Session two focuses on evolving issues in Caribbean corporate law and features the launch of a book on corporate business principles by our very own esteemed colleague, Suzanne Folks Golson. As the world struggles with the impact of climate change, tomorrow in session three, the panel will explore the role of some of the key jurisprudential developments in this field. The final session will examine international and domestic laws that are designed to protect the children of the world from heartbreaking harm and injustice. These areas have always been of paramount concern to lawyers, judges, academics, and anyone concerned with providing a safer and more just society, which respects the rights of every citizen with the COVID pandemic, the need for greater attention to these pressing problems has been underscored. And so I am very grateful and happy to welcome all the presenters and session chairs who will share with us their expertise and insight on these important topics. Mona Law has been fortunate to have the support of the campus administration in our activities. And indeed, the principal of the UWI Mona campus and Pro-Vice Chancellor, Professor Dale Weber, wishes to greet you now. Although he is unable to join us live, he will deliver his greetings through a brief pre-recorded message. And so please join me as we listen to the recording by Professor Weber. Good morning. 
It is my privilege and pleasure to bring greetings to the Mona Law 6th Annual Symposium on Law, Governance and Society in my capacity as Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. I wish to congratulate the Symposium Secretariat under the leadership of Dean Chazida Ali for organizing this sixth staging of the symposium. The quality of past symposia bears witness to our commitment to excellence, and I have no doubt that this year will be no different. I must also use this opportunity to congratulate Mrs. Suzanne Folks Goldson on the publication of her latest book, Corporate Business Principles. Mrs. Folks Goldson has been a foremost authority in the constantly evolving corporate law landscape. The text will certainly be useful to students and practitioners while enhancing the growth of the local and regional jurisprudence. The legal profession is an integral aspect in the just operation of any society. Lawyers are at the vanguard of justice systems and play a critical role in holding us accountable across all sectors. As time moves on and life changes, we are faced with situations that we must adjust to. A part of the adjustment always concerns the rule of law and protection of individual and collective rights. This year, 2020, is a different year. It's heralded worldwide changes and the responses that we have had to make to the coronavirus. As we navigate a new normal, a normal which will have differences. Occupation and health and safety, the work from home, whether by policy or by reality, meeting contractual obligations in a climate of extreme financial crisis, obligations to facilitate and continued access. These are but a few of the things that you will have to contemplate in the legal profession. If we are to survive and to thrive, under these circumstances, we must be appropriately informed about the various facets and issues. An understanding of the rule of law is essential to informing all our plans for the present and especially for the future. This symposium is an excellent way of fostering that understanding. I hope you will find all the presentations and the discussions to be enlightening and engaging. They have always been. Moreover, I hope that together we can generate solutions to all the problems we have. Thank you for joining us for this symposium, and I look forward to hearing great things as we discuss through this weekend. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words and warm greetings, Professor Weber. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists, colleagues, and friends of Mona Law, it is truly my pleasure to welcome you to our first online symposium. Through the wonders of technology, we can all connect this weekend, albeit virtually, in this surreal world, parallel universe known as Zoom land. Anyway, by now I'm sure you're all on the edge of your seat as you anxiously await the start of the presentations. So please allow me to invite my friend and colleague, Tracy Robinson, who is the Deputy Dean for Graduate Studies and Research, and she will now introduce the keynote speaker. Tracy? Thank you, Dean Ali. Uh, a warm welcome as well to you all. I am a Mona Law teacher, as the Dean mentioned, and it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the symposium the Honorable Mr. Justice Adrian Saunders, President of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And he'll be talking about the challenges facing the judiciary in this novel period. He, he's no stranger to the University of the West Indies and Mona Law. And in fact, he met with students here a few weeks ago virtually in the law and legal systems class with Gabrielle Elliott Williams. It's an especial honor to hear from Justice Saunders in the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Faculty of Law, because he was one of the Faculty of Law's early graduates as a youngster from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, having been admitted to the third class in 1972. 
there is a remarkable consistency to the kind of judge uh, that Justice Saunders has been since joining the bench in 1996, nearly 25 years ago. From sitting in trials as a high court judge in well-known cases like Benjamin from Anguilla uh, to the Court of Appeal of the Eastern Caribbean, acting as Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and as one of the earliest judges of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Consistency in the sense of his open-mindedness, his cosmopolitanism, his forward thinking quality in imagining justice, peace and development in our region his lack of pretension and accessibility born out of his abiding love for the Caribbean and optimism about our possibilities for self-determination as states premised on dignity and worth of everybody. I would describe Justice Saunders as the judge who over and over meets the moment in the Caribbean from the acute political crises in Guyana to the mandatory sentence of death. It's no accident that his 2001 judgment in the co-joined uh, appeals of Hughes and, Hughes and Spence may be the most cited Caribbean judgment of the last three decades. His judgment there with his colleagues set in motion the abolition of the mandatory death penalty almost everywhere in the Caribbean and incidentally, he had been serving as a high court judge for just five years uh, when he was called up to act as an appellate judge in that case. Justice Saunders's unashamed ambition for the Caribbean, seen through his leadership in building ideas, what he calls Caribbean prudence, a Caribbean jurisprudence which captures notions of a just, empowered Caribbean, his commitment to building institutions notably to make the CCJ a court that serves all, even if we haven't all fully accepted it yet, and strengthens all judicial institutions in the Caribbean, and his commitment to generating cultural shifts in the Caribbean's juridical space. These are all some of the reasons we so value hearing from Justice Saunders over and over again. Welcome again, Justice Saunders, and over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson, for that very flattering introduction and good day to all. It certainly is a distinct pleasure to be joining you today, albeit by virtual means, at this symposium on law, governance and society. As I'm only too well aware that sometimes virtual seminars and lectures can be even more exhausting than in-person events, I shall try my best to keep it in my allotted time. The theme for this symposium, Law and Justice in a Novel Era, presents me with an opportunity to reflect on how justice systems across the Caribbean are not just coping with the scourge of COVID-19, but also drawing lessons from the consequences of the pandemic and simultaneously to consider how in a proactive manner to apply those lessons to illuminate a path forward into the future. My address shall therefore focus on these two areas, how we cope and how we progress. COVID-19 has been severely disruptive to say the least. To curb and manage the spread of the virus, many countries were constrained to close their borders, to institute curfews and to restrict the movement and congregation of people. These measures have gone through several phases of tightening, expansion, and relaxation. Handshakes and hugs have suddenly been replaced by elbow bumps. Amazingly, within the space of a few months, the wearing of a face mask, which many in the Western world used to regard with a mixture of ridicule or derision, as we saw them on airport concourses, that has now become essential and in some cases, mandatory. The novel virus has made commonplace a new lexicon involving words and phrases such as quarantine and lockdowns and flattening the curve, PPE, screening, physical distancing, and one can go on and on. There's absolutely no doubt that in a mostly unwelcome manner, the pandemic has altered behavior and permeated every single aspect of our lives. 
COVID-19 has naturally also had a tremendous adverse effect on the functioning of judiciaries. For the regional justice sector, and this was certainly the case at the Caribbean Court of Justice, the response to the havoc being wreaked has centered largely around three core pillars. Firstly, ensuring the health and safety of judges, staff, and court customers. Secondly, preserving fundamental rights. And thirdly, ensuring continued access to justice. In seeking to secure health and safety, judiciaries across the region have had to take pains to manage the physical space that encompasses courts. The measures taken have included restricting and in some cases excluding public access to the buildings. The establishment of work from home or remote work rotations for judges and staff alike. The institution of screening protocols to manage access to court buildings, including of course temperature checks and the administering of questionnaires. Putting in place arrangements to ensure appropriate physical distancing and even making alterations to the physical infrastructure at the court, for example, to install protective screens around certain workstations. The value of these measures ought not to be underestimated. In these stressful times, it is important that every effort is made to assure court staff and customers alike that the court environment is safe and that the leadership of the court has their health and safety foremost in mind. The second pillar has to do with the need for even more scrupulous efforts to protect and preserve fundamental rights. The management of crises such as a pandemic by the legislature and executive invariably results in the promulgation of emergency and public health regulations. These measures are in many cases accompanied by the deployment of the coercive agencies of the state who are called upon to enforce the measures. It is precisely in times like these that it is easy, tempting for these agencies to overreach and to encroach on fundamental rights, even where their intentions may be noble. The review function that the constitution affords to the court therefore comes under heightened scrutiny. In a situation such as this, courts must jealously guard their independence and be astute to any unlawful diminution of the rights and freedoms of the citizenry. The pandemic, or indeed any other crisis for that matter, provides no justification or excuse for trenching on the constitutional protection framework. Lord Atkins' dissent in the context of World War II emergency legislation remains apt. One recalls his haunting admonition that, and I quote, amid the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. They may be changed, but they speak the same language in war as in peace, unquote. In times of crisis, courts must therefore strike the balance in determining what level of curtailment of our precious rights and freedoms is reasonable and proportional. In pursuing this delicate task, courts may consider the Oaks test propounded by Chief Justice Dixon in a notable Canadian case. Are the measures adopted carefully designed to achieve the objective in question? Do they curtail as little as possible the relevant right or freedom at stake? Is there proportionality between the effects of the measures and their objective? Applying these questions to an impugned act or regulation is one of the primary ways in which judges might maintain their independence and protect fundamental rights. But even where the court is unwilling or unable to strike down a regulation passed by the executive pursuant to powers granted by parliament, I know of at least one case where the court was still concerned that the legislature should retain or be afforded appropriate parliamentary scrutiny over the breadth of regulations issued by a minister. In a case, a recent case from Trinidad and Tobago involving a challenge to the COVID-19 public health regulations, Justice Budu Singh, while upholding the constitutionality of the regulations, nevertheless urged the Attorney General to consider at a minimum some form of appropriate parliamentary scrutiny of the regulations.
The third pillar around which judiciaries are fashioning their response to the pandemic is guaranteeing as far as possible continued access to justice. Every effort is being made to assure the right to a fair hearing within a reasonable time and to afford the full protection of law to the citizenry. Courts have accordingly employed a variety of strategies. They have issued practice directions which relax some of the requirements for compliance with court rules, including time compliances. They have extended bail. They have prioritized certain categories, categories of cases over others. And at a more strategic level, they have embraced technology enabled court sittings and many are currently exploring electronic filing. Implementation of these measures has not been without challenges. Some judiciaries were not yet equipped fully to utilize relatively sophisticated modalities, but they had to adapt quickly so as to ensure that the business of justice delivery continued apace. In some instances, Legislation was required to enable the deployment of teleconferencing and video conferencing solutions. Legal challenges to such legislation spectacularly failed. Many of you would have heard of one such instance in the Turks and Caicos Islands, where the challenge was to a Jamaican judge conducting virtually part of an ongoing trial while the judge remained in Jamaica. The matter made its way to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which only a week or two ago agreed with the TCI Court of Appeal that there was nothing wrong with the impugned regulations deeming the place where the judge sat and connected remotely as being part of the courtroom in the TCI. And so preserving health and safety, protecting human rights, affording access to justice, these have been pillars on which courts have sought to respond, to mitigate against the disruption and challenges caused by the COVID-19 crisis. This response has been a critical component of keeping the wheels of justice turning in these novel times. But as I said at the outset, it is not enough merely to cope with the pandemic. In coping, valuable lessons have been and are being learned. We must now resolve to apply those lessons to chart the way forward. How do we do that? How do we, as is now often asked, build back better? The answer to this may be summed up in one word, innovation. Judiciaries must reimagine and in some respects re-engineer the ways in which justice services are delivered. The image of the judiciary as a staid conservative establishment impervious to change and almost contemptuous of novelty must give way to institutions that are agile, that earn the trust and confidence of a public that yearns for timeliness, efficiency, and modernization. I would identify three conditions for building more robust and responsive judiciaries. Firstly, there must be deeper and more meaningful collaboration on policy with the other arms of the state. Secondly, there must be a ramping up of the modernization initiatives with particular emphasis on the deployment of ICT-based solutions. And finally, there must be an even greater focus on strengthening the rule of law. What do I mean by deeper and more meaningful collaboration on policy with the other arms of government? In many respects, the efficiency and effectiveness of the administration of justice depend not on the judiciary operating in a silo, but on all three arms of the state moving in a synchronized manner towards a common and sufficiently articulated goal. Traditionally, and it is still sometimes the case, there is a prevailing view that the executive should be wary of too close an interface with the judiciary. But for my part, I believe that it is crucial that on policy issues which impact on the administration of justice, it is necessary for all arms of the state to be on the same page in relation to meeting the needs, filling the gaps, and offering and implementing the solutions. The criminal justice system is a prime example that illustrates the need for such collaboration. 
In most English-speaking Caribbean countries, the criminal justice system is beset by delays, backlogs, unacceptably high rates of pretrial detention, overcrowded prisons, inefficient trial processes, low conviction rates in some states, inappropriate and inadequate mechanisms for treating with drug, drug addicts and youth who come into conflict with the law. And one can go on and on. The criminal justice system, however, is not a single system, but an amalgam of several separate but interdependent ecosystems, many of which fall under the purview of the executive, including the police, prosecutorial agencies, the prisoners, probation and welfare services, parole boards, and so forth. We should also list here parliament as a key player in the overall criminal justice system. In order for the wheels of the criminal justice machinery to turn smoothly, there needs to be an alignment of interests and meaningful collaboration among the high command of these various entities. Solutions to the fundamental problems plaguing criminal justice will not be sustainable if judiciary on its own does a little jiggling here and there, or parliament passes this or that law without first discussing its implications with representatives of the judiciary, or if a state agency embarks on policies whose impact on the courts is insufficiently thought through. Effective criminal justice reform requires a holistic and not a piecemeal approach. And that is only possible with collaboration among the various branches at both a policy and an implementation level. This segues, yesterday I witnessed a joint presentation by representatives of the Trinidad and Tobago Ministry of Transport and the Magistry in that country that fully demonstrated the point. That country has introduced a modern demerit points system that harnesses modern technology. And it was very pleasing to witness the obvious collaborative efforts of the judiciary and the ministry. This segues nicely to my second area, the modernization of the judiciary. The onslaught of COVID-19 has brought into even sharper focus the need for technological solutions to the challenges. Now, there is undoubtedly a value in the lobby and predictable, certain, stable, but we absolutely must issue that tendency towards conservatism that seems endemic in judiciaries. It is a tendency that I believe common law practice and tradition encourage. We follow precedents established in the past, but in charting our way forward into the new normal, there must be a conscious effort made to innovate, to adopt court processes and rules of procedure that are customer friendly, effective, and designed to enhance efficiency and earn public trust. Courts have been traditionally associated with the notion of being an exalted, a sacred place of robed priestesses and priests who dispense justice from on high. Even the physical infrastructure reinforces this image with the judge seated on a lofty perch looking down upon supplicants seeking justice. The pandemic has graphically illustrated a mantra that has been repeated for several decades now by the British professor, Richard Susskind. Susskind has suggested that in fact, the court is not to be regarded as a place, but rather as a service. In other words, courts, I suppose this may also apply to other public service bodies, but courts must see themselves principally as a provider of services. And as such, they must leverage appropriate technology to enable these services to be provided without necessarily requiring the physical attendance of service recipients or stakeholders. Let us illustrate this concept by reference to the criminal justice system again. Take jury management. Jury trials have been significantly disrupted because of the pandemic and the need to maintain appropriate physical distancing. Many judiciaries have actually been forced to halt jury trials. I recently had a very intriguing conversation with Mr. Beville Wooding, the Executive Director of Advanced Performance Exponents Incorporated, APEX. APEX is a CCJ established not-for-profit co-technology company that actually provides the CCJ's electronic case filing and case management platforms. 
Weber's view was that it was possible to get jury trials going again in the current climate through the use of cinemas. Cinemas too have been largely affected by the COVID-19 restrictions, but cinemas have big screens, ample seating and sophisticated audiovisual equipment and cinemas rarely operate by day. What of seating the jurors in the cinema more than adequately physically distanced and establishing a video link from the court to the cinema. Of course, there are small details that would be necessary to make this work, but this is an example of devising innovative solutions to seemingly intractable problems. And this we can do once we start with the notion that the court is not a place, it is a service. Lastly, I believe judges must continue to emphasize the strengthening of the rule of law concept that is expressly provided for in our constitution. I believe that more can and must be done to reduce arbitrary action on the part of state officials and to ensure greater accountability on the part of those who exercise public power. Courts must ensure respect for and protection of human dignity and personhood of every single member of society and have appropriate respect for their autonomy. Courts must advance the rights of minorities, women and girls, the poor, the vulnerable, and those consigned to an existence at the margins of society. Judges must strive to have a greater understanding of issues such as gender equality and intersectionality, so that we see those who appear before us as a whole and not merely as an abstract complainant, claimant or defendant. To these ends, we must be willing to interrogate in a bold and honest manner the laws and practices we have inherited from colonial times. Do these laws and practices represent who we are and what we stand for? Do they advance our Caribbean civilization? Should we as independent and sovereign nations simply accept laws from a particular era, no matter their provenance or impact, simply because they were bequeathed to us as colonies? The CCG has made its position clear on many of these points in cases such as Nervis and Severin and McEwan. As I said in McEwan, civilized society has a duty to accommodate suitably differences among human beings. Only in this manner can we give due respect to everyone's humanity. No one should have his or her dignity trampled upon or human rights denied merely on account of a difference, especially one that poses no threat to public safety or public order, order. In closing, I must say that I remain optimistic about the prospects for the judiciaries of the region to rise to the challenges ahead. And the Caribbean Court of Justice is committed to playing whatever modest role we can to assist in this regard. The CCDA considers that we must not only model judicial excellence, but also act as a transformative agent within justice sectors regionally. And this commitment is embedded in our strategic framework and outlook. Strategy issue six, strategic issue six of our 2019 to 2024 strategic plan addresses itself to enhance regional justice systems capacity and performance. In a sense, one might regard the CCG as a center, a hub, for regional justice system enhancement. So that, for example, the office of the president of the CCJ currently serves as a secretariat for the CARICOM Conference of Heads of Judiciary and Chief Justices. And there are other ways in which the CCJ has made its resources, both human and material, available to a variety of different organizations in order to enhance Caribbean jurisprudence. The CCG also plays a distinct role as a centralized agency for administering externally funded judiciary improvement projects. And so we are at a stage where I believe we have a secure platform in which to enhance our justice sector throughout the region. In our thrust to promote Caribbean jurisprudence, the court, the CCJ, will make available through a knowledge management system that we are about to institute a variety of knowledge products which 
can assist in guiding judiciaries across the region, assist in training judicial officers, and generally to ensure that our Caribbean judiciaries are in lockstep with each other as we forge a path together. So despite the dismal situation we now face in the circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, I continue to be optimistic about the prospects for the judiciaries in the region to rise to the challenges. And naturally, the CCG will continue to do all it can to enhance the justice sector across the region. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice Saunders. Uh, that presentation captures a range of concerns, but also I think very importantly, um, your own focus on the rule of law as a central, uh, a central virtue uh, to influence a range of other things. Um, so you spoke about the rule of law as promoting access to justice, the way in which technology is critical to that innovation and agility, uh, but also how the protection of rights and the rights of those who are most marginalized and vulnerable are, is critical in crisis. Uh, but you also mentioned another dimension of the rule of law in the context of the crisis. Uh, one of the tensions around the issue of separation of powers raised by Justice Buddha Singh, uh, which is that the strong regulation from the side of the executive has weakened generally the measures of parliamentary oversight we're used to. And um, he offers a tentative step into that arena, but it may be one courts are increasingly acts to think about. And finally, maybe conceptually, you offer a sense of the rule of laws also asking us, um, are our laws good law? Can our laws, which are based and come from a colonial period without significant review, uh, continue to support uh, the Caribbean and its own development and modernization? And you mentioned um, the, the views of the CCJ on this, although I would say the views of the majority, uh, because there have been important dissents in the direction which the majority has offered. Um, thank you so much for those thoughts. And I note significantly your vision of separation of powers as including collaboration, collaboration between different arms of government, even as we emphasize the independence of the judiciary. Uh, it's one of the reasons we often talk about separation of powers in far more dynamic ways than we have in the past, using the kind of old Heinz paradigm. And finally, to mention the way in which you suggest and agree that courts should be a service, a service to community, a service to the Caribbean, uh, not a space of simply robes of priestesses and priests, uh, but a place the Caribbean is served. Uh, and all of these bits are part of how I hear you offering over the course of your more than two decades of judging notions of this just Caribbean, a jurisprudence which is not just abstract, but is producing justice for Caribbean people. Thank you so much, Justice Saunders, uh, for your thoughts today and for beginning uh, the symposium in the 50th year of the faculty's creation as one of its early graduates. Uh, can I now hand over uh, to uh, the Solicitor General of Jamaica? A minute early, uh, Mrs. Aldred, uh, Solicitor General will lead us in the first session, uh, which looks at issues of um, financial regulation. Mrs. Aldred.